you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris There we Moss. go. And the Iron Lady sings and that makes it official. I didn't hear it this time, but we'll just assume that it went. Thanks for joining the Chris Voss Show, folks. Welcome to the big show. And as always, the Chris Voss Show is the family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law. We had an amazing author on the show who's broken an amazing story and documented in his new book, Among the Bros a fraternity crime story that came out november 7th 2023 in the meantime be sure to follow the show refer it to your family friends and relatives go to goodreads.com for chess chris voss linkedin.com for chess chris voss subscribe to the big linkedin newsletter the 130,000 linkedin group over there and uh, chris voss facebook.com and chris voss one on the tickety talkity max marshall is going to be joining us on the show and talking about his latest book which is an interesting story at the at at uh, that's harrowing and disturbing according to the billing and about fraternity life. So we're going to get into his story and what goes into it and why you should buy the book and get it as a page turner. Max Marshall has written stories for Texas Monthly, GQ, Sports Illustrated, Esquire, and the New York Times. This is his first book, Among the Bros, and uh, all that good stuff. Welcome to the show, Max. How are you? I'm good. It's good to be here. There you go. So give us any dot coms. Where do you want people to follow you on the interwebs to get to know you better? Yeah, just max-marshall.com. You can find me on there. My email's on there. You can reach me on there. And then the book is available, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Audible, Kindle, wherever books can be found. So. Whatever fine books are sold. There you exactly. go. Might be the, some alleyway the finest, bookstores, yeah. too. But stay in this alleyway bookstores. You might get stabbed. That's what happened to me last <laughs> I had to get a tetanus shot last time I was in one. Anyway, so thanks for coming on the show. Congratulations on the new book. Give us a 30,000 overview of what's inside your new your new story. Sure. So I was in college the same time as all the guys in this book, 2012 to 2016. Mm -hmm. And when I was in school, I was in a fraternity and I saw a pretty shocking, at least shocking to me, amount of Xanax flying around. Wow. When I got to school, I thought of Xanax as basically something parents take on international flights or some of you might take if you get a panic attack while taking a test or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out it's a massive party drug. Uh, wow. you, you can mix it with basically anything. People call it a sidecar drug, like the little sidecar next to a motorcycle and like a cartoon, and or I guess in real life too. But yeah, you can mix it with cocaine and ease the paranoia, mix it with acid and, you know, you can fall asleep on a come down. But the most common is mixing it with, you know, five or six natty lights and you feel like you had 15 or 16. Wow. And so it's kind of falls into that whole like blackout culture trope but all that's to say is I just saw so much of it and none of my friends were sort of warned that it was so addictive. You could die from withdrawals. It's mm. one of two drugs that's that addictive. Really? And yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible. You can have seizures. It's Holy pretty God. dangerous, dangerous stuff. And after school, I became an investigative journalist. I kind of had written some crime stories investigating, you know, big international drug cartels. I started to wonder, where do all these Xanax pills come from on college mm -hmm. campuses? Because they're not coming from Pfizer. They're not coming from CVS. They're basically fake, chalky Xanax pills. And so I Googled Xanax bust fraternity, like a, a good investigative journalist. And the first result was an article in the Charleston Post and Courier about fr fraternity guys that got caught with 40,000 Xanax pills. Plus an assault rifle, grenade launcher, a few pounds of cocaine, <laughs> dozen pounds of weed. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll start looking into this. And then a defense lawyer let it slip that actually they got caught with closer to 3 million pills. The police Ooh. had let them get away with it. Never announced that they had confiscated that many pills. And a student had been killed in a murder. Others had died of overdoses. And the story just kind of grew and grew from there. And that's when I kind of knew there was there was a book there. Wow. Grenade launchers, cocaine, 3 million pills. That's Fridays around here. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So you trace a murder and a multi-million dollar drug 
ring. And I guess do you find that part of this is it was was involved in your own fraternity, or was it the other fraternities around the nation? So, so yeah, I mean, I knew guys in my fraternity who were dealing certainly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the year before I got to college, there was a, a pretty big FBI bust at my school as well. But yeah, something I found out kind of doing this reporting, and this is something that people knew all over the Deep South. If you talk to guys at fraternities at Georgia, UNC, you know, Ole Miss, like the big Southern SEC schools, they all knew that the pills started at Charleston. And so they would start there, and then these fraternities would use their pledges and basically ship the pills out kind of through the fraternity system all over the U.S. It's like a network. It is, yeah. I mean, it's a massive, massive... and the the press when it happened kind of described it as like a, a drug ring, but the guys who were in it said no no it's more Mary Kay Cutco you know a multi level <laughs> marketing scheme, uh, wow. yeah or a, a pyramid scheme depending on who you ask. There is a guy on your cover of your book with a pink shirt, so the Mary yeah. Kay thing. Exactly yeah yeah I didn't even think of that subliminal marketing is always it's key. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, so this is really interesting. Do you do you know the the opioid crisis has kind of filled the news cycle? Do you think this is really an un unreported, untapped thing that that more news agencies need to look into? Absolutely. I mean, so the statistics are are pretty harrowing. In the same period since I want to say two thousand, opioid overdoses have gone up eight x. Xanax mm-hmm. overdoses have gone up twelve x. So it's an even wow. faster rise. And then if you look at a lot of opioid overdoses, there's actually Xanax involved. Wow. And what there's sort of a breaking sort of line of thought in addiction science right now that what we're in is not an opioid crisis. It's what they call a polypharmacy crisis, which is basically when you're mixing drugs, the synergistic effect is much worse than an opioid would be alone. And funny enough, that's the same idea as a sidecar, which is what, you know, the guys were calling Mm. Xanax. But when you combine Xanax and opioids, it basically slows down your nervous system and your breathing so much faster than either do alone. And yeah, like something like 40% of opioid overdoses actually involve Xanax. And so mm. it's sort of the hidden sidecar, you know, s- sitting right along this, this bigger crisis. Yeah. I'm just going to go back to heroin then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, that's, it was funny. I was talking to one addiction specialist at Stanford and she was like, Oh yeah, back in the day, you know, People just kind of had one drug and stuck with it. You know, you were a heroin guy or you were a booze hound or you were a cokehead. But certainly like when I was in college, it was really like, you know, my generation's all about mixing and matching and customizing. And so it was very much, you know, I've, you know, certainly had nights myself and seen nights of others where you're like, oh, shit, I'm on four things right now. And you're sort of like (laughs) balancing them, you know. Yeah. The, and, and by the way, the attorneys folks say, don't do heroin. That's a joke, yes. people. Yeah. We do comedy on the show. Keep that yeah. in mind. Don't write me. Don't write me and say things. But, you know, I mean, I, at my age, I'm so glad I'm over all that stuff. I just sit in mainline high caffeine coffee. Yeah. And so that's I'm what I do. I just jam mine. a needle in yeah. and get a yeah. pump in the morning and, Love and I'm good throughout the day. In fact, I just keep a pump in me throughout the day. And that's I can tell. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so what do you think you found that, that, I mean, this is, this goes into something called Greek life. What is, mm-hmm. what does that mean? So, yeah, I mean, Greek life is the fraternity and sorority system in American mm-hmm. colleges. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of kind of movie cliches of fraternities. You know, you think of animal house or old school, yeah. but something that's not talked about as much is the fraternity system. The story system is really where America the elite of American society congregates. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way since the beginning. When fraternities started in the 1800s, basically up until the 1800s, only really wealthy kids went to college. Mm -hmm. And then in the 1800s, middle-class students started showing up from their farms and, you know, wanting an education too. And basically the guys from, you know, Connecticut all came together and said, all right, well, we don't want to drink with those guys. So what are we going to do? And they're like, oh, I know. Well, what if we create a club that's just kind of for us? And that's continued over time. And if you look at the statistics, over 70% of every dollar given to American universities come from Greek life alumni. So it shows you the amount of wealth concentrated. And then all but four presidents since 1825, 80% of Fortune 500 CEOs, all but a handful of Supreme Court justices, all are from Greek life. And so even though it's only 2% of our population, it really is kind of the closest thing we have to like a world order almost, but it's not, Mm. 
it's it's kind of hiding in plain sight. You know, people imagine something like the Illuminati or something, but really it's just, oh, you know, I was an SAE with him and we like, you know, I'm going to help him get this job or something. It's not, wow. in that sense, it's like very banal, but in another sense, it is kind of the, it's one of those like skeleton keys that helps you understand the American elite, I think. The bro culture. Yeah. yeah. Now there's a face of a, a young man on your on the cover of your book. Is this a generic face or is this someone who was involved with the story you uncover? So the guy on the cover, and you can see him over my shoulder, he's the founder of Sigma Nu from the 1860s. I oh. think that photo was taken in the late 1850s. Mm -hmm. And the kind of crazy thing, and I talk about this a little in the book, is you can look at fraternity composites over the years and you can look at a composite from 1870 and a photo from 2022 and they have the exact same haircuts. <laughs> and so that guy, or I guess in mirror, that guy, he has the exact same haircuts as all the guys in the book. And wow. so we, we took that photo and then threw the, threw the pink, the pastel yeah. Mary Kay shirt on him. He should be okay. I don't think he's going to sue you for you. Yeah, I mean, that was, yeah, that's a nice thing about it. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't heard from his ancestors. His, yeah, his, yeah. There you go. But I like how you threw a pink polo on him. So yeah. it's got that sort of 80s effect sure. going on there. I think that's a polo. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I lost yeah. that of fashion. That's something's for my thing. But uh, so what, what do you want people to come away from when they read this book? What do you want people to think about? Sure. So, I mean, it's a few things. Like, first of all, it's like a page turning crime story. And so I, in some ways, I just want people to be immersed in the world and kind of get the specifics of kind of how this all works from rush to hazing to this crazy drug ring. But if there is like a eat your vegetables component to it, I guess it's a few things. It's one, I think the book's kind of about the consequence of a, a world without consequences. These guys mm -hmm. can kind of get away with anything. The book opens with a bunch of them going on a mountain weekend and, and basically burning down a cabin. And then the alumni come in to basically pay for it and make it go away. And then, you wow. know, just through the book, it's just DUI here, simple possession there, you know, drug dealing charge, robbery. And each time the parents sort of step in or the alumni step in or the fraternity national chapter steps in wow. and kind of makes it all go away. And uh, it's almost like that, um, that, that, Tarantino movie Death Proof. You know that movie? It's 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 yeah. about a, a stunt driver that kits out the driver's seat of his car with all this safety barring. So basically, no matter what wreck he gets in, he's going to be okay. Yeah. And if you're in the passenger seat and there's a wreck, you're you're done for. And if you're in another car and there's a wreck, you'll probably die. But mm -hmm. you're in this passenger seat where nothing can happen to you. And I think or your driver's seat. And I think if you can be in that death proof box, like course you're going to do crazy stuff and mm -hmm. i think the book kind of gets crazier and crazier as the guys get away with more and more mm -hmm. and then, we have that kind of build here at the show when i do the show oh nice yeah i thought yeah. you were kind of in some sort of box yeah, or something. Kind yeah, of you, box yeah. behind the green yeah, screen you, you do look you look very safe um, yeah. mainly it's to keep me contained that's good yeah, uh, yeah, and there's yeah. it's yeah. it's pretty much a rubber room behind yeah, the green yeah, screen yeah. but uh, i did hear some echo they let uh, me they let me know every now and then they put they just put the food underneath the cell door so but this is kind of interesting, you know, you, we see a lot of this in, in all sorts of different things. You know, if, if you've got parents that have money, influence, power, fraternities, uh, colleges have money, you know, I'm sure colleges, you know, maybe there's been some things that where they just want to make stuff go away or Definitely. hide stuff for the, yeah. you know, they get, they get massive donations. And like you said, lots of funding from these guys when they go on to work for big corporations and CEOs and stuff like that. You've been kind of seeing the fight over that going on right now with the, you know, the Harvard uh, president 100%. resigning. And I think there was another, I can't remember the other college where she resigned. And Yeah, I think it was Penn maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the donations, I guess, the people who were donating money were the biggest pressures on getting them to resign and and the loss of, of donation money or the threat of. And, and so it's kind of interesting to see money influence that. And welcome to America, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. I think a lot of people don't realize that the, in some ways, the main job of a university president is fundraising and, mm -hmm. you know, growing these massive endowments. You know, the biggest schools have multi-billion dollar endowments and then the smaller schools are all trying to catch up. And I think when people wonder why is Greek life so resilient, even though, you know, one kid dies every year from hazing and really? many more die from, you know, alcohol or drug related accidents and incidents. I think one of the simplest answers is, well, 70% of every dollar given to a college is coming from these alumni. Like, why would you want to turn that spigot off? 
Wow. And so, yeah, it's just, you know, the, the cliche of money talking. Yeah. Did you find that some of the people in these distribution networks that were maybe kingpins or, I don't know, head of local chapters and stuff were kind of maybe tied to some of the richest parents and, and the most the kind of elite? Yeah, I mean, that was, it was an interesting thing, right? Because the sort of classical reason, you know, if you take like a criminology class for why someone deals drugs is economic need just like simple as that, right? Like rational choice theory. It's basically, you know, I live in a neighborhood where the opportunities I have are so limited that this is like by far the clearest path to putting food on the table. Mm -hmm. But when you find these kids that some of them, you know, have trust funds or certainly, you know, are driving into town with Mercedes that their parents bought them. It's like, what, why deal drugs? And it's almost this inverse thing of, I think there's status in showing how much you can get away with. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, oh, if, if a middle-class kid is coming to school and he has student loans to pay, you know, he can't go out seven nights a week and he yeah. can't, you know, break the law and then have his parents bail him out. And it's almost a sign of prestige, basically. And this is what some kids even told me. There, you know, there's a quote in the book that literally says, it's a sign of prestige that I can get away with this. And so it became this kind of crazy status game so I think that was part of it. And yeah. I think an, another part of it is sort of like College of Charleston specifically has really, really wealthy kids coming from like Greenwich, Connecticut, Westchester, these like super wealthy New England suburbs, Northeast suburbs. Mm -hmm. And if you're upper middle class and next to a literal Rockefeller or Rothschild, you might feel like, oh man, like I'm, I'm broke. And so I need to, if I want to get bottle service this weekend, like I better figure something out. Yeah. Plus, you're trying to impress girls. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, that's know, so much of it. Yeah. Jason getting laid and stuff yeah. like that in college. There's a little bit of that going on in here. 100%. Um, yeah. yeah. A little bit I of mean, the gender ratio at College of Charleston is something like three to one girls to guys. And so, really? Yeah. It's, Note it's, to self go back to college. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, there you go. It's, those are good odds. I like that. The, uh, so, I mean, this is, and, and when there's millions of dollars circulating around this, I mean, it's no chump change, right? I mean, no. it's, yeah, you can. I mean, you can basically pay for your college at the very least. Yeah. Well, it, it, one of the guys in the the story, he was a little older. He was a fraternity guy from South Carolina, and then he was in his late twenties, early thirties by the time everything got busted. Mm -hmm. But he was the first guy in American history to have Bitcoin seized by the DEA. Oh wow! And if you look at the amount of Bitcoin he got seized with, and then took it up to whatever it was, the 2021 or 22 peak, mm -hmm. he would have, I don't know, like $40 million or something. Holy um, crap. So there was, yeah, I mean, there's very real money in this stuff. There you go. With Xanax, you know, I, I never took Xanax. I never played with it. I mean, is there long-term effects and damage that maybe some health effects that we need, you know, your, your book warns about that, you know, it would seem if it can cause seizures and stuff that maybe there's maybe some long-term effects of overuse of it. Definitely. So, I mean, the first thing to say is even though Xanax sometimes gets prescribed for everyday generalized anxiety, there's never been any study that's shown that it's effective in treating generalized anxiety. It's good for, <laughs> it's good for panic attacks and it's good for wow. seizures. But if you just have that sort of ambient everyday anxiety, what it does is it basically calms you down completely. And then the next day the anxiety comes back worse. And so that wow. creates a very addictive cycle and like I said, it's so addictive that you can die from withdrawals. And so that's that's crazy. The sort of main problem that it causes is just incredibly habit forming. And you need more and more mm -hmm. and more to kind of get to sort of zero. But then, yeah, there are long term cognitive effects ranging from sort of like paranoia, worse panic attacks than you've you know ever had before. But then, especially with the elderly, it causes a lot of dementia as well. And there's like huh? me memory effects too. Which I guess isn't that surprising because when you take Xanax, it often leads to blackouts. And so, you know, it, yeah. it is definitely doing something up there in the, the memory. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see the long-term effects on it. You said, you know, different members of SCOTUS and people work for the government. That might explain some SCOTUS rulings. Actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, then it might explain the uh, Citizens United ruling. Um, so, yeah, this is really interesting. Do you, do you find, uh, I mean... This, I guess kind of a dumb question. Did you find any feedback from colleges or fraternity associations that maybe you pinged for comment on the book? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I reached out to all the fraternities for comment. None of them really wanted to talk. You know, they kind of would send back stuff from their lawyers. I do think there might be a bit of a, a Goodreads campaign from some of these fraternities to review uh -huh. bomb, review bomb it. Although, oh, no. I, yeah, <laughs> which, you know, what are you going to do? But yeah, I, the thing is, the drug ring is one thing. In terms of the hazing that I talk about in the book, and there's some pretty wild hazing, you know, there's a guy who gets waterboarded and there's definitely some pretty yeah. intense stuff in there, but it's all decently open secrets if you're in that world. Mm -hmm. And something that's kind of funny about the fraternity world is, you know, it's known for this sort of cloak of secrecy. And when it comes to outsiders, there is a cloak of secrecy. You don't really talk about it. But then if mm -hmm. you're inside the bubble, people won't shut up about it. Like I remember going back to Texas for Thanksgiving break and all people would talk about is their craziest hazing stories because all mm -hmm. of us were in fraternities and it became this sort of, you know, dick measuring contest for yeah. lack, of, lack of a yeah. better phrase. It probably took place in some hazing things. It, <laughs> some of the hazing things they do, man, are just yeah, insane. Crazy. And then yeah. the desk kind of got out of hand there and I think colleges had to start clamping down on stuff. Yeah. It was just crazy. Of course, one of my favorite movies is Old School. Yeah, I think there's some hazing that goes on. Yeah, that's definitely, crazy. definitely, definitely. So there you go. So you go through this, you tell the story of it, and all that good stuff. Do you do you see? Is there any future storytelling you see coming up? Is there any future books you're working on? Yeah. So right now, Sony's options this book as a film. Mm -hmm. It and would so, be a great film. Yeah. So yeah, and so yeah, talking to them about that. There's some interest for a documentary as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have a podcast coming out in a few weeks about something else entirely. And then, yeah, getting back to figuring out book number two. There you go. There you go. Well, this has been really interesting. Give us a final pitch out to order the book to everybody in your dot com. Sure. So, yeah, it's Among the Bros, a fraternity crime story. You can find it, as Chris said, wherever good books are sold. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Audible, Kindle, kind of anywhere. And then my website's max-marshall.com. And yeah, my email's on there and feel free to reach out. There you go. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Max. We really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed it. There you go. Thanks so much for tuning in. Order up where refined books are sold among the bros, a fraternity crime story that came out November 7th, 2023. Thanks so much for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss one on the TikTok, and Chris Foss, Facebook.com, and Chris Foss YouTube.com. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you guys next time. And that should have a second.